Good morning. Welcome to Dunmore Baptist Church for our morning service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to set this time aside, to concentrate our thoughts, to concentrate our mind, to look to the things of God. Lord, deliver us from all the distractions, deliver us from all worries and cares. Open our hearts and minds to receive your truth and speak to us, Lord, we pray. Speak, make us listen, and make us obedient. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I want to read this morning from John's Gospel, chapter 7, and... Uh, starting at verse 1. John's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 1 to 15, and then verses 25 to 31. John's Gospel, 7, 1 to 15. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand, so his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to the feast yet, for my time has not fully come. After this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, He is a good man, others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly, spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marvelled, saying, How is it that this man has learning, when he has never studied? Verse 25. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly, and say, they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from. But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him, because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of being able to read it. Thank you that it records what Jesus said in response to what people around him said. Teaching according to the need of those who were taught. So Lord, teach us. You know our need. Lord, speak to us, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I want 
to look at the subject of knowing Jesus. Last week we looked at the subject of knowing God's will and we took that from verse 17 which we didn't read this morning. If anyone's will is to do God's will he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. So this is very much related knowing Jesus and knowing God and knowing God's will because in order to know God's will you really need to know God. And if we know Jesus then we do know God. John 14 and verses 7 to 9 the Lord Jesus says there If you had known me you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? That's the subject for this morning. Knowing Jesus. Jesus is the revelation of God. He is the full expression of the Godhead in human form. So if we know Jesus, then we will know God. And if we know God, we will know God's will, which is what we were looking at last week. So I want to look at the text, or take as a text, verse 27, 28, where the people who were in Jerusalem made this amazing statement. We know where this man comes from. And when Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me. And you know where I come from. But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. Basically, Jesus is saying, you don't know what you're talking about. God, the Father, sent me. I am the expression of the Father in human terms. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And you think you know me. It is a striking, though probably unintended, testimony to the complete normality of Jesus' home life, character and general behaviour for the first 30 years of his life. So perfectly normal and unspectacular he was that these people, who at very best could only have known Jesus since the family settled in Nazareth after they returned from Egypt, assumed that they'd known him all his life. They couldn't have done. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They knew nothing about the virgin birth. They knew nothing about the angels coming. They knew nothing about the shepherds. They didn't know a thing about the wise men. They didn't know a thing about the flight into Egypt and the time they stayed there. They just knew that after the family had settled in Nazareth, when Jesus was, I don't know, four, five, something like that, they thought they'd known him all his life. They, uh, they didn't have even the most basic knowledge of where he was born. And uh, the people in Jerusalem and Bethlehem, surrounding districts, they would have known about the wise men and the uh, other things that went on. The reports spread around 30 years earlier, but presumably they hadn't linked that up with Jesus because Jesus came from Nazareth and uh, they didn't join up the dots. It's a, it's a common problem. We see people in a situation and we get to know them in that situation and we often assume that we know them fully. But actually we know practically nothing. 
could even be we're only seeing an act. I uh, remember being completely disenchanted one time when one of my favourite characters, or rather the actor who played one of my favourite characters, played a different character in a different film, and I was shocked because I had assumed this actor was like the character he played in the first film. But he wasn't. He was just acting. So how do we know that we know people? <laughs> well, we have a problem. And I want to consider that problem because the subject is knowing Jesus, but we have to look at prejudice, first point, facts, second point, and reality, the third point. These people said, we know where this man comes from. Jesus said, you know me? Question mark. So, let's have a look. Prejudice. You know, it's practically impossible to come to any subject without prejudice. We always have some preconceived idea. And that's especially true when it comes to people. It could just be a, a chance likeness. We, we see their face and we see the likeness to somebody we like and we are prejudiced in their favour. Or, or maybe against them if it's somebody we don't like. Or maybe their name. It may be a name we associate with a really lovely character and we're prejudiced in their favour. Or it may be a name that we don't like. Maybe a smile, it may be their hairstyle, it may be their clothing, it may be their voice, or it just may be the context where we meet them. It all plays a big part, and we can be greatly deceived. I remember once being fully in favour of somebody, I was attracted to them, I thought they were great, because they looked nice. And they sounded nice, and they behaved themselves nicely in the circumstances. But then I saw them when they were in different circumstances, and they did not behave themselves nicely. We can be so prejudiced. And of course, this is what romantic fiction is about. Books are all about people who meet up uh, and they... Uh, dismiss somebody and then they found they made a mistake and they're, they're really beautiful after all and so on and so forth. We know the kind of stuff. Everyday life is full of examples of the dangers of prejudice. And yet, we can't help ourselves. However hard we try to keep an open mind, we always have this instinctive prejudice for or against a person. And that is particularly true when we come to Jesus and God. You know, the mere mention of Jesus or God in a conversation can instantly change the tone. Some people go quiet and bitter the moment you mention God or Jesus. Others get a little bit angry some go defensive. Some start listing all their good works, so that helps. And some will get enthusiastic and warm when you mention Jesus. And if Jesus happens to be a really good friend of yours, if you really know Jesus, you can only assume that the angry, bitter, wary, defensive, negative reactions are all based on prejudice. Because they don't know what they're reacting to. They've, they're reacting to some kind of mistake they've made about the character and person of God. They cannot be based on facts. As Jesus says in verse 24, do not judge by appearances. Judge with righteous judgment. 
And for that, you need facts. Not prejudice, not hearsay, facts. In the context, the claims of these people, we know this man, uh, where this man comes from, were manifestly untrue. They probably didn't know it. After all, Jesus was known as Jesus of Nazareth and, well, he comes from Nazareth. He wouldn't be known as Jesus of Nazareth if he didn't come from Nazareth, would he? But uh, they didn't know his birthplace. They didn't know his early history. They didn't know his father. They knew his mother, maybe. But Jesus says quite categorically, you do not know my father. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. And, incidentally, or well, not that incidental actually, they did not know their scriptures. Because they said, when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. But anybody who knew the scriptures would know exactly where he comes from, because when Herod asked that very question, Matthew chapter 2, verses 3, when Herod the king heard the wise men asking for the king of the Jews, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The information was available. They knew precisely where Christ should have, uh, would come from, or rather they should have known where Christ would come from. But no, they said when Christ appears no one will know where he comes from. Basic ignorance. That fact was available. And they didn't even bother to look for it. And this is another basic problem with human nature. We have our prejudices. And the devil likes to keep us away from facts. Things that we can actually check up on. It's so much easier to believe conspiracy theories if you don't look at facts. It's so much easier to believe evolutionary theories if you don't look at facts. And most of us, although we wouldn't actually say it except as a joke, Work on the principle of, I know what I think, don't confuse me with evidence. This lazy ignorance lays behind almost all religious prejudice for or against Christianity. People don't know the facts. So Jesus attracted opposition and sneers from ignorant people who didn't know the facts. But he also attracted enthusiastic support from other ignorant people who assumed that he was going to raise an army and throw out the Romans and, and, had, and fulfill their political ambitions. And when Jesus failed to fulfill their political ambitions, they were very disillusioned and bitter and cried out for him to be crucified. Exactly the same thing happens today. We have people in, all around us who sneer at God and dismiss him as an irrelevance, completely unaware of, if you think about it, the obvious fact that their very existence, their health, their strength, everything else, depends upon God's love and grace. They would dismiss that with the hazy, lazy kind of idea that they evolved from some kind of primeval sludge. No. They're designed. They're beautifully made. Even the most tatty human body is an amazing thing. And we can't give it life. God is the source of life. 
But anyway, moving on from that one, you have the other people who follow Jesus for political or social ambitions, and uh, when Jesus doesn't fit in with their ideas, when he doesn't follow their agenda, he doesn't endorse their ideas, they, they quote, lose their faith. How many people have you heard of who lost their faith when God didn't do something they wanted done? Right? The people who lost faith in Jesus and wanted him crucified because he didn't start rallying folks against the Romans. But neither of those two reactions would happen if people looked at the facts. But as I say, the devil doesn't like facts. He doesn't want people to look at evidence. He likes prejudice. He likes to work in the dark. He likes to move us around by opinions that we, we, we hold very strongly, but we can't actually defend. That's our situation. That's human nature. And instead of looking up facts, we tend to write and read books and articles that support our own prejudices. Now, who reads books about stuff? People who already believe it. You write for your fan clubs. But when people really look at the facts, the story's different. And so there are some wonderful occasions when somebody has, has really dug into the scriptures, determined to prove from the Bible this or that or the other. And they find the facts and they find God. They need a strong dose of reality. We all need a strong dose of reality. So the first two points kind of by way of introduction. And here's the main one. Reality. Human nature, with its love of prejudice and its dislike of the time and effort required to actually look at the facts, is the same for all of us, whether we are Christians or not. As Christians, we are just as prone to prejudice as anybody else, because the old human nature lives on in all of us. The very best of Christians still have to fight prejudice. We are drawn to certain types of people. We are drawn to certain styles of ministry. We're drawn to certain attitudes and all the rest of it. And we're very lazy about checking up on the facts. There's nothing wrong with being drawn to certain things. That's fine. You can have your preferences. But to believe that those preferences actually matter, that's prejudice. Unless, of course, we have some scriptural facts on the subject. For instance, there are people who suffer doubt. They feel that God loves everybody, but he doesn't really love them. Now that could be described as humility. You know, I'm less than the least of all saints. But it's not humility. It's prejudice. Prejudice against yourself. Because God loves every individual Christian equally. God gave his son for the salvation of every individual Christian. Therefore, for us to think that we're somehow specially unloved is just not scripturally true. It's not in accordance with the facts. It's a prejudice which causes us pain. Same way as it would be if we thought that God loved us more than everybody else. That would be pride but it's still a prejudice in our own favour. And it's still scripturally untrue. God loves all of his people. If we could just follow the thinking of the facts, we would be so much happier. But anyway, that's a, a slightly different thing. In the context here, 
we know, verse 27, where this man comes from. When the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from, question mark. But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true and him you do not know. The reality that we need to focus on, the reality that we need to build our attitudes, our opinions uh, and our actions on, it all centres squarely on knowing God. Jesus says, you think you know me and all that. Him, God who sent Jesus, you do not know. If you had known the Father, you would know the Son. And you would know where he came from. And you would know what he came to do. And so on. Knowing God is what really matters. In John chapter 14, verse 7 to 9, I've already referred to this, Jesus says, <clears throat> just repeating it here, uh, Jesus says to Philip, who said, show us the Father. Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. Really knowing who Jesus is. Really knowing where he is from and why he has come. He is God. God on a mission to save us. This is the eternal rock. This is the foundation stone on which our eternal life rests. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And remember Isaiah. Behold, I lay in Zion a strong foundation, a firm foundation. Jesus is God, God the Son, in human form. Visible, knowable, understandable even from a human point of view. He looks human, he's normal. And yet the perfect expression of the infinite and invisible God. That's quite something. If we could just get our heads around that idea, if we could just keep that fact in mind, it would help us so much when we consider what Jesus says. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 to 3, In these last days God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world, he, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he, Jesus, upholds the universe with the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's Jesus. He's upholding the universe. And he made purification for sins, and he is sitting at the right hand of the Father now. And this, this fact that Jesus was the creator and upholder of the universe was proved over and over and over again in Jesus' ministry. He showed God's power over the devil. He showed God's power over the weather over sickness, over disease, over disability, over death, and he forgave sins. Godlike actions. Now, 
this is the um, the point that John is making in his gospel over and over again, all the way through. John's gospel proclaims the fact Jesus is God. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, in the beginning the word uh, was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, without him was not anything made that was made. That ties up with what we've just read in Hebrews. He is the creator of all things, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And John 1 verse 14, the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, the Word, the Creator, the Upholder of the Universe, became flesh and lived among us. And verse 18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, that's Jesus, who sat down at the Father's right hand, that's where he is now, he has made him known. And at the end of John's Gospel, he rounds the whole thing off by Thomas, the disciple who wasn't there when Jesus came and saw the other disciples after his resurrection. Then eight days later, Thomas was there. And Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand, place it on my side. Do not be disbelieving but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus is God. Either that, or he's a total fact and a really bad man because he accepted worship from Thomas. But his, his works prove, the facts prove, he is God. So, where is he from? Jesus of Nazareth. No, that's where he lived. How about Jesus from Bethlehem? No, that's where he was born. He is from God. He who sent me is true. I know him. I come from him. He sent me. Jesus is from God. He is really and truly a person of the Godhead. He was there at creation. He is the creator. He was there when Adam and Eve sinned. He was the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day who called Adam, where are you? He knows what God's house looks like. He lived in it lives in it since before time. Infinite glory, infinite wisdom, infinite power and goodness are everyday life and experience where Jesus comes from. He comes from perfection. We get so proud of our culture our civilization, our church, our home, our family, our looks. We get proud of all sorts of things, but it's, it's pitiful when we compare it with Jesus, where Jesus comes from. Pure, holy, righteous God. Why did he come? This is the reality, and this is the fact that should lay all our human pride and self-confidence in the dust. The infinite, pure, holy, awesome and glorious God came for us. In spite of all our evil, ingratitude, rebellion, stupidity and general worthlessness, he came because God loves us. John chapter 3 verse 16. God so loved the world, he gave 
his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is good. And because God is good, loving us will, will mean sacrifice. Because sin must be paid for. God can't just ignore it. Jesus didn't come of his own accord, as verse 28b tells us. The Father sent him. Now, this isn't Jesus shielding us from an angry God, you know, as the angry Father, and Jesus stands in between. It's okay, don't I'll look after him. It's not that. God the Father sent God the Son to save us. God the Son gave himself to save us. God the Holy Spirit enabled and empowered the human body of God the Son to save us. It's a vast subject and we can never really know the full depths of it. But God loves us. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit loves us and gave himself for us. And you know, that's what we're going to be doing for eternity. The love of God, the wonder of God's love, is going to be an eternal lifetime's study to get to know God. Every day learning more for eternity. But that starts, our eternal life starts, when we become a Christian. When we are born again, we are given an eternal life. That life never dies. When our body dies, we go to be with Christ, which is far better. The life continues. Our body will be resurrected. We will rejoin our body and continue for eternity. But the life the eternal life of getting to know God through Christ starts when we become a Christian. Hence Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17. So um, he prays that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. An eternal lifetime study to know Jesus. And you get these unbelievers here. Oh, we know this man. We know where he comes from. They didn't know anything. The reality is so much greater. And they made even their shallow claim because of ignorance. They didn't know their scriptures and they didn't know easily available facts. And they didn't know, probably, because they'd never asked. They lived in Nazareth they knew Jesus, would it have been difficult to say, so where were you born? But they never had. Sadly, many of us Christians are woefully ignorant. We make shallow claims about our doctrinal purity and understanding because we too lack understanding of the scripture. The Bible is given us for a reason. It testifies of the Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks to us all the way through about our Lord and Saviour. You know, the, it's not for nothing that John says at the beginning, the Word became flesh and lived amongst us. Okay, it wasn't a Bible that became flesh and lived amongst us, but the Word of God and the Scriptures, there's a tie up there. The Bible is given to reveal Jesus to us. 
so that we may grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Peter says at the end of his letter. So that we may know why Jesus came, understand more of why the Father sent him, understand the love of God in Christ. Uh, as Jesus says in his prayer in John 17, and verses 6 to 7, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. And I have given them the words that you gave me and they have received them and have come to the, know the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. That's why he came. That's where he came from. And we know this through the scripture. And the more we study our scriptures, the more we will know our Saviour. And we'll just be beginning our eternal occupation of knowing loving, serving, rejoicing in our God for eternity. May God help us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who is so pure, holy, perfect and yet a human being that we can almost come to grips with the idea of Lord you are the imperfect invisible unknowably glorious and holy God and yet in the fullness of, in Christ we have the full expression of the Father full of grace and truth Lord help us to understand help us to understand your word help us Lord to see Jesus in the scriptures and to love him understand him and rejoice in him more. Lord, keep our hearts and minds stayed upon the facts your word reveals and deliver us from prejudice or half-truth or pride or any other of the devil's lies and distortions. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name.